I want to thank everyone. I want to welcome you all. Good morning. This is Michelle Sikirka with the New Jersey Business and Industry Association. Um, and pleased to co-host with Tom Bracken from the New Jersey Chamber of Commerce. And we are joined today by many of our New Jersey Business Coalition members. I want to thank the press for joining us this morning. Tom is going to open this morning um, with a high-level overview. I'm going to take us down into some details, and then we're going to turn it over to Q&A. And we invite all of our colleagues from our business coalition to join in on the Q&A and to the press. If you have any specific questions that you would like um, anyone from the coalition to answer directly, uh, please direct the question to that person. You can see everyone is on. Most importantly, I want to ask everyone, please, if you could mute your lines while you're not speaking so we can avoid as much background noise as possible, because we do, as I said, have a good crowd on. So with that, again, welcome, everyone. I want to turn it over to Tom Bracken to kick us off this morning. Okay, thanks, Michelle. Uh, and again, as Michelle said, thank you all for being part of this today. It's, a, it's an important message we want to give uh, before the uh, budget uh, hearings start and before the budget is uh, passed. So let me just kind of frame what we're talking about today. Pre-pandemic, our governor ran on a stronger and fairer economy. <laughs> And um, he ran on that, he was elected on that, and he followed through very uh, diligently on creating a fair economy for the state of New Jersey. We all congratulated him for that. However, we lobbied against a lot of that because it cost, the, the cost of that fair economy was borne by the business community. Also, we constantly um, pleaded with him to provide more emphasis on the stronger side of the economy because of the need for balance and the fact that the accomplishments on the fair side would not have the opportunity to be fully realized unless a stronger economy was created. At that time, uh, our affordability and our competitiveness were dropping. We were wasting our huge demographic and geographic location advantages but nothing was re really being addressed from the standpoint of the stronger economy. Then came the pandemic. It created a, an unthinkable medical crisis plus an unthinkable economic crisis that took our already struggling economy to new depths and it prompted our labor commissioner to describe where we are today as economic devastation. We currently have businesses struggling to survive Business closures happening every day. We have the second highest unemployment rate in the country. And alarmingly, we have no plan to begin a revival. Not only do we have no plan, but there is hardly any discussion of our economic crisis, which gives you the impression that the administration doesn't think it exists. Just think of all the governor's press conferences that you've had, and there have been over 100 of them. The medical crisis is front and center. How often has the economic crisis even been mentioned on any of those press conferences? We have had high profile commissions and committees set up to start the rest to provide restart and recovery processes, but still no plan. The medical crisis was thankfully attacked aggressively by our governor. And we now have his statement last week where he said, our health data is as good as any state in the country but we still have no economic plan. And recovery only between phase two and phase three, and quite frankly, probably closer to phase two. We need an aggressive attack on our economic crisis, similar to the one employed to control our medical crisis, if we hope to avoid taking our current economic devastation to new depths. We have all been pleading for that because the survival of our state is at risk. So what has been the response to that? A budget that drives more nails into the business coffin by proposing more taxes on job creators, aggravating our affordability with unnecessary borrowing, adding new spending to further enhance the fairer side of the governor's mission, and giving minimal attention to the growing cost of our expensive government infrastructure. Also, there is nothing, and I repeat nothing, in the budget to support our struggling business community. The governor stated um, that the, I'm, I'm sorry, the governor stated last week that our state was number one in K through 12 education for the second year in a row. We were number two in the country in helping working families with worker protections. 
And he said that we were one of the best states in the country to live and work. All underscoring his accomplishing of the fair side of our economy. But what he did not say was that New, Jer New Jersey was ranked 48th in business competitiveness for the second year in a row. And we are gaining ground on number 49. And we are also beginning to be categorized as a business unfriendly state. We hear the word fair used a lot. The governor's stronger and fairer mission. The progressive groups constantly chanting for business to pay their fair share. The governor stating last week that the millionaire's tax was simply asking for fairness and equity in looking out for our working families. But fairness meet, needs, but fairness means balance. And that is what our state lacks. Balancing fairness, uh, balancing the fair and stronger economy aspect of the governor's mission and balancing the medical crisis with the economic crisis. The needs of our business community have been and continue to be ignored and dismissed. And the proposed budget is the poster child for that. Our economy is in horrible shape, but the administration seems to be in denial of that as evidenced by the budget. We cannot tax our way out of this crisis. We cannot spend our way out of this crisis. We cannot borrow our way out of this crisis. We need a restart budget that gets us on a path to recovery. One that answers the needs of the business community, one that welcomes business to, businesses to stay, grow, and come to the state of New Jersey, and one that puts citizens back to work quickly, which, by the way, is the best absolute solution to helping our middle class. Um, business as usual, the same old tactics, ignoring our fundamental problems, and hoping things will get better will not work. We need this proposed budget to be dramatically altered if we have any hope to regain our economic recovery that will benefit all our citizens in the best possible way, which are reviving our economy, creating more jobs, growing our revenue base to adequately fund our essential services, which are the keys to enabling us to regain, we don't have it yet, but to regain a label of a great state to live and work. I'll now turn it over to Michelle, who will go into a deep dive on some of the budget particulars. Michelle, you're on mute. Michelle, you're on mute. Gotcha, gotcha, thank you. I thought I thought it came out, apologies. I want to um, invite the press and everyone to um, recognize the chat function um, because there are some good statistics being posted up there by some of our partners in the, chest, uh, the press also, if you'd like to ask questions there, we'll have the opportunity to ask questions um, directly in a few minutes. So yes, let's take that deep dive. Um, Governor Murphy's budget does not deal with the reality of where New Jersey's economy is today. What is the reality? Our economy is in the tank is where the reality is. Our gross domestic product contracted by 5.5% in the first quarter of 2020 and is 10% worse than the national average. Second quarter, the nation's GDP contracted by an additional 32.9%, which is the worst quarter in recorded history. And we know during second quarter, New Jersey continued with stay-at-home orders and non-essential business closures, which means that our second quarter contraction is likely to be even worse again than the historically bad national average. Unemployment insurance, Tom alluded to this. In July, New Jersey saw one of the worst unemployment rates in the nation at 138 only Massachusetts, Nevada, and New York were worse. Over 33% of our civilian labor force, or 1.5 million people, have filed for unemployment insurance since March. It's clear that our businesses are struggling as a result, our workers and the state is struggling as well. The outlook from our New Jersey businesses is not optimistic. The current capacity restrictions are unsustainable for the vast majority of businesses, according to our NJBIA recovery survey, where we learned that 83% of our businesses stated that they require 50% or more of their usual patient, patrons to just break even. That's not even making a profit. 18% declaring they need 100% of their patrons to break even. Those are not sustainable when we continue in a pause mode of 25% capacity. The proposed budget does nothing to stimulate our weak economy and further puts long lasting strains through unnecessary borrowing, higher taxes and new spending. 
The fiscal year 2021 budget should focus on actions to stimulate the economy, not kick those that generate economic stimulus when they are already down, meaning our businesses. Now, let's look at taxes, borrowing, and spending. Now is not the time for yet more taxes, especially on the exact population affected by the crisis, the job creators. What's significantly frustrating about the tax discussion and the new taxes being proposed is that Governor Murphy depends on new taxes no matter what the economic climate. When the economy was good and revenues were growing naturally, he asked for more taxes. And we warned then, if you're taxing in a good economy, what are you gonna do in the event of a crisis? And here we are, the economy and revenues are down and now he asks for more taxes. And we have to believe here in the state of New Jersey will there ever be a recognition that enough is enough for the most, most taxed state in the nation, the most taxed state in the nation. A fiscal year 2021 budget can be sustained without the billion dollars in new taxes. Here's how. Rely on our surplus that exists for this exact purpose. That's what our surplus is there for, a rainy day, and guess what, we're in the middle of a storm. Now, Governor Murphy deserves credit for his efforts to increase the surplus, but a budget surplus is designed to provide a cushion for unexpected events, like the one we find ourselves in today. And it's interesting, in the midst of our rainy day, our surplus still continues to go up and is not being used in any way to help people of New Jersey that are hurting right now. After going through a once in a lifetime health and economic crisis, the proposed surplus is actually $900 million higher than it was when we entered fiscal year 2020. That increase is almost equivalent to the increase in taxes. So if the surplus remains at 1.3 billion, there's no need for the new taxes. And that 1.3 billion is still higher than the surplus as Governor Murphy inherited from Governor Christie. Additionally, a healthier surplus in today's budget is less necessary because of the unused borrowing capacity, which is akin to a line of credit that we can tap if we need to in case our situation gets even worse. Now let's pause for a minute and say, why do taxes matter? Because we hear all the time, the fairness that Tom talked about, right? This is an impact on competitiveness, regardless of how fair they sound. It's not about who pays the higher tax and whether they can afford it. It's about the collateral damage to our economy from the increase. And that collateral damage is people choosing to move, expand business or shift or shop in other states where taxes are lower. An example of this are some of the taxes being proposed and what the results could be. And let's talk about that. An income tax increase where we expand those paying the second highest ta tax rate in the nation, the result, more income residents, high income residents choosing to retire in another state besides New Jersey. Over the past 12 years, we know, and you've heard BIA say this ad nauseum, $24 billion in adjusted gross income continues to leave the state of New Jersey. And that number grows year over year. Corporate business tax increase that would permanently keep us at 11.5% would give New Jersey the highest rate in the nation as Iowa's 2021, now the highest, continues to phase down and will be less than ours in the next fiscal year. The result, multi-state corporations choosing to expand their sales and operations in other states that won't cost them as much. Higher cigarette tax, many will say sin tax. What's the problem? Result, smokers spending more money at grocery stores, delis, and gas stations on either side of the Hudson or Delaware rivers. That's a loss of revenue to the state of New Jersey. Being the only state in the nation that is trying to reverse a recent federal tax cut on qualified small business income, the result, entrepreneurs opening their business in another state are hiring one less person for their new small business in New Jersey. Tax increase on limousines. The result, seeking cheaper limousine service outside the state. Again, hitting revenue directly that we won't appreciate here in the state of New Jersey. Higher boat tax. This isn't just about the tax itself. It's about fewer sales, South Jersey industries. We have those who manufacture boats here in the state of New Jersey. It's going to be devastating to that industry and, again, lose revenue to the state of New Jersey. And a new tax on drug manufacturers and distributors that burdens the whole logistics industry, the result will make medical care, patients needing responsible pain relief more costly. There's also other taxes being discussed, such as the new tax on financial transactions. The bill is pending right now. And Governor Murphy very clearly is in favor of this. The result, make it very easy for financial service firms and their data centers to move to Long Island, just north of New York City, or to Southwest Connecticut. That is true. It's too easy to move those data centers. 
At a time when more businesses and residents are looking to leave New York City, we should capitalize on that and make New Jersey a more attractive part of the New York economic region, not less. And all the taxes we just talked about affects our competitiveness. We are already struggling with competitiveness. Now let's talk about borrowing. This is not the time for new borrowing. Here's a fact. At $215 billion, New Jersey's debt is now five times the state's total budget. You all have seen that chart that I hold up when we speak, right? The fiscal cliff. We've been there, and this borrowing will only tip us over further. Our state debt levels should worry everyone because it means that other spending on programs that can help people will be crowded out in the future when all that money is going to go to debt service. If we borrow more, debt service costs in the future budgets will grow. And those costs are already high and our overall long-term liabilities compound those future cost concerns. Every effort, every effort should be made to keep new borrowing for operational expenses to a minimum so we can afford the things that we all want instead of just paying off loan interest in the future. All those safety net programs, they will be crowded out by debt service in the future. And this is something we should all be deeply concerned about. More important, this level of borrowing today is not necessary. And here's why. A case could be made to eliminate any contribution this year to the pension. However, just at a minimum, if we cut the contribution to $3.7 billion for a $1.2 billion savings, this would hold New Jersey at the fiscal year 20's seven-tenths pension payment, which allows the state to maintain the progress it has made and not backstep. This is still higher than any previous administration's contribution, and that $1.2 billion could be freed up to reduce the borrowings by at least 30%. When it comes to the pension contribution, please let's remind ourselves that whatever dollar figure is settled on, it will still go toward a broken and unsustainable system that will continue to rely on new taxes and borrowing well into the future. We need to do better. Cutting the borrowing could mean cutting hundreds of millions of dollars in debt services and budgets over the next several decades, future generations, next generation of worker in New Jersey. This is what we need. We need to control that borrowing. We need to do it now. And this is not the time for new spending. The budget should not grow $1.4 billion or 3.6% over last year in the midst of an economic downturn when revenues are down. In fact, this administration has grown our budget $5.4 billion more than the budget three years ago when the governor took office. New Jersey already spends more than most states and new spending not related to COVID-19 should be eliminated right now from the budget. Without that spending growth, the new taxes and the borrowing become even less necessary. So what is it time to do now in the state of New Jersey? We all know what it's time to do because we should have been doing it for the last decade plus. It's time for structural reform. This has been debated and discussed for years, if not decades. It's the lack of will to make these reforms that continues to hurt our competitiveness and has made us even more vulnerable during this rainy day. Now's the time for structural reform similar to the ones proposed by Senate President Sweeney, Senator Sarlo, and Senator Oroho in the bipartisan Path to Progress report. Bring down the cost of pension and health benefits from overly generous to merely generous. That will help this budget and our massive long-term liabilities as well. Examine government structures and any overspending that comes from too much government is also necessary. We know New Jersey residents would understand and support a budget that includes savings because they themselves are asked to tighten their belts right now. If we can't do this during a pandemic, the structural reforms that we've needed so desperately for decades, if we can't get it done now and be forced to rethink and be innovative of how we address our needs in the state of New Jersey, there will never be a time to do it. So in conclusion, a fiscally responsible budget demands a reduction, if not an elimination of the $5 billion in proposed new revenue for taxes, spending and borrowing. Affordability and competitiveness issues have been slowing the growth of our economy for many years and exacerbating these problems after businesses were already devastated by the pandemic's economic shutdown will cause further devastation for the very same taxpayers that we need to restore the jobs and revenues lost over the past few months. The job creators, they're the ones who are going to get us out of this mess and they're the ones we need to enable with a responsible budget. It's only the jobs and their revenue that can get our economy back on course. So let's face it, New Jersey has crushed the COVID-19 curve. Let's not, to con- let's not continue to crush our economy. Let's pass a budget that will restart it. Hey, Michelle, let me just add one thing to the uh, budget uh, conversation. <clears throat> and I think uh, everybody realizes that New Jersey is basically in an economic turnaround situation. In my career, I've gone through three different turnarounds. And the two basic premises to attack any turnaround is first, 
you look at your costs and become as efficient as possible and cut out any extraneous expenses that you have. And secondly, you find ways to enhance your revenue to make sure that you are taking advantage of all your uh, assets and make sure you maximize your revenue opportunities. This budget does neither of those. This budget creates a bigger hole because it's plugging all the gaps with debt and new taxes, which only add to the economic burden that we have already. So the basic premises of any turnaround situation are totally being violated by this budget. So I wanna open it up to the press and again, please, um, we have industry experts here on the line. If you have specific industry questions, uh, bring them on, uh, but the floor is now open for questions. Hey, it's uh, Daniel with NJ Biz. can you hear me? Yes, Daniel, good morning. Morning. Um, I guess, I, I believe Mary Lou Halverson is on the line, but um, if not, my, my, main, my main question is how any of you think indoor dining went this, the, for the first week and um, whether it was good, whether it was bad, it, any takeaways? I, I, I know, Michelle, you said 25% is, is not a lot, is not enough. I'm just interested to hear first impressions of, of the first weekend of indoor dining. Mary Lou Halverson um, is yeah. on the line. So go ahead, Mary Lou. Thank you. Uh, yes. So thank you, Daniel. Uh, it was good. It, you know, obviously it's helpful for those restaurants that have outdoor dining because the weather we know is spectacular. So to be able to complement it with 25% on indoor dining, um, you know, was great. The problem is for the small restaurants in cities that don't have outdoor dining, they just didn't open because if their capacity is, you know, 35, 50, just doesn't make sense to, um, to open the doors. So they really need to get to 50% sooner than later. And especially as we transition into the colder um, season, what has been a struggle for the restaurants is staffing. Uh, that has been, it was prior to pandemic and, and really is, is a struggle now. So I know that that is actually also has limited some people's ability to reopen even indoor at 25%. But all in all, people seem very receptive. Uh, they were happy. Um, I was out there and, uh, you know, just randomly to the restaurants in my town and um, spoke to some people. Uh, everyone seemed to be really comfortable. The restaurants seemed to be doing what they needed to to keep people safe. Do you, do you think it's going to, is it going to be viable for any of these restaurants to do 25% just because there are questions about the, with the rate of transmission going back up and questions about a, a sort of a wave from a, a Labor Day spike with all the travel and closed gatherings and yeah. packed beaches. So there are concerns that, so, yeah. Yeah. there. I mean, and, and you bring up a good point because the, the issue is, is that, you know, it seems to be restaurants love, you know, everyone likes to use restaurants as a scapegoat for the rate of transmission or spot positivity to go up. But we know that there's a lot of other industries open and you can't just blame the restaurants. I, I just hope that the contact tracing will be transparent because what we've seen in other states, um, you know, Michigan and, and some of my other states I've reached out to where the Department of Health has shown that um, it is not restaurants that are creating you know, a spike. Uh, there's other industries that contribute. And so I just really hope that, you know, if the number goes up, it's just not automatically let's shut down the restaurants because they're not, you know, the contributors. Um, so, you know, we, we will continue to do, but 25% as we move into the fall certainly is not going to be nearly enough. Uh, it works well now for when you have outdoor dining. But as I said, there's some restaurants that chose not to open just because 25% wasn't worth it. All right, thank you. Go ahead, Tom. So a question for, for anyone, uh, the, the interaction with the legislature, um, do you feel like you have any inroads there? Do you feel like you have any support? You mentioned the Path to Progress report, which, which is very smart, but gone nowhere. Like through that, um, you know, this is the first time it's executive order. Do you feel like you have any play going through the legislature? Um, I think that, you know, we have uh, the legislature looking at this budget, not in exactly the way we are, but with um, some caution and understanding the realities of what we're talking about, about borrowing, taxing, uh, and adding new programs at a time when the state just can't afford it. So 
I think we have uh, some receptive years in the legislature, but uh, obviously time will prove us right or wrong. Yeah, I just want to add that I think that when it comes to new programs, you see some of the um, legislators stepping out and saying this is not the time to create a new program, no matter how good that program may look. Um, and we need to focus on really, you know, holding our own as best as possible. Uh, look, this is the time we're going to continue to engage with all of our policymakers and bring the data forward. We have a lot of data that tells the story here. And the key for us is educating, you know, all our policymakers on those um, consequences uh, that are real. Um, and sometimes we don't think about those consequences in the first instance uh, when something looks pretty good saying, yeah, let's just do that. And we think that'll be OK. Um, but when we come back with the data that shows what the real consequence of that action could be, we we hope that that data is going to help drive the day. And Tom, the other thing about it is look at the uh, <clears throat> look at the uh, essential services that are being crowded out that need money in this budget. Uh, and as opposed to providing a record setting pension payment. Uh, and things of that nature. So it's a matter of priorities. And if new program spending should take precedence over providing essential services to our citizens, I'm sure the legislature will look at that very constructively. Yeah. I do think that's just another extremely important part on the borrowing aspect of creating more long-term debt in the future, which means paying off debt service versus funding safety net programs. Again, this is where I think we need some good education because on its face, people think what we, what we should be filling a bucket with today, and they just don't realize how those programs can be crowded out in the future, and we need to continue to shine a light on that. And, and also, Tom, if we don't, if we don't start to uh, close this budget gap with organic revenue growth, we have a problem. We are closing a budget gap with a one-time $4 billion debt that's going to have long 30-year carrying costs of interest. And that $4 billion of gap will still be there next year because it's being closed by a one-time, a one-timer, which I, I think the governor has tried to avoid at all costs, but the $4 billion one-timer could be a record-setting one-timer. Hi, this is uh, Catherine from Politico. Morning, Catherine. Morning. Um, just a question on using the, you know, switching the pension payment for the borrowing. Um, can you explain the rationale behind some of that? Because, you know, if we're not stepping up and increasing the pension payment, um, you know, to prevent um, borrowing, I just, I just don't see how. Um, you know, it's, we're still going to be increasing our debt if we're not uh, if we're not stepping up that pension payment. Catherine, the pension we have in New Jersey is a long, long-term systemic problem. The pension system does not have a short-term liquidity problem. There is money in the pension to make this year's payments and probably payments for many of the years to come. So a $4.9 billion, $4 billion pension payment is not solving any current problem because there's no liquidity problem. It's not solving the long-term systemic problem because even if we make a payment uh, higher than mandated, it isn't gonna solve the, the, uh, the underlying problem we have with the pension system. So we have other priorities that are real problems in New Jersey that are current problems that need to be addressed. So that's why I think an argument can be made for not making any payment because you're not solving any problem, but you're really aggravating some existing problems we have in other parts of the state. So I want to invite Chris Emma Holtz, who's our tax expert, um, to address that question, Catherine. Thank you, Michelle. Thank you, Catherine. And thank you, Tom. I think Tom's points were right on. But I think very simply, Catherine, it's an excellent point, and it's probably one that, that could easily be debated back and forth. But there are two kinds of debts. The pension debt, uh, our long-term liabilities, is kind of a softer debt. And it's a debt that you are not, unfortunately, all too many times in past budgets, you're not held as accountable if you can't make that. And the uh, debt service, uh, borrowing debt, is a hard debt. Uh, the state has never not paid its debt service off. It's treated differently than, than other long-term liabilities. Both debts are bad. Both debts, our state needs to right the ship and, and, and fix what's been done by governors of both parties in the past. But the um, debt in front of us, I think, I think the responsible thing is to avoid the long-term hard debt that $4 billion in borrowing for operating costs would get you. 
And if, if holding off on a pension payment increase and maybe keeping it flat to last year or keeping whatever is affordable, I think Governor Murphy deserves credit for, for increasing that 10th payment um, in his first few budgets and, and planning to do that. It's, it's, not a, it's not a wrong decision, but given all that we're facing, I think the better decision is to avoid that level of borrowing and reduce that as much as possible. Thanks. Thank Anyone else want to add anything to that? I know we have some tax experts on the uh, on the line yeah. here. I, I was going to ask for Ralph Thomas to jump in because he's, he's always good on everything, especially this. If you could talk about the tax implications, short term, long term, people coming out. Ralph, I know you could talk for like six hours, but give us the, <laughs> the shorter version um, and let's see what you got. Well, the shorter version is that our members in a recent poll that we did um, were opposed to uh, the millionaire's tax opposed to uh, restating the 2.5% uh, tax on corporate businesses because they just felt that, again, to Tom and um, Michelle's points, uh, this is not the time to try to tax our way out of this. Uh, we should be looking at, in, in typical businesses that are in this situation, they look at how do you reduce costs? How do you become more efficient in what you're doing? So. Those are the things that I think concern my members and I think uh, the other members of the business coalition that, we've, that we have in terms of that piece not being done. Uh, there's really been no focus on that, on you know, how to be more efficient here in the state. Uh, the focus seems to be on starting up new programs. And in a, in a situation that we're in like today, that's not the route that you want to take. Thanks. Ron. And uh, statistics have been coming through in the chat about, you know, how our members feel on uh, a lot of the issues that have been discussed to the, today about the proposed $4 billion borrowing. 63% of our members oppose that. And only 28% um, are, are somewhat supportive of, the, of, of borrowing. So I think, you know, when you, when you look at the fact that CPAs pretty much touch every constituency here in the state, who has a better pulse read on, on how the business community and individuals are feeling about today's situation here in New Jersey. Thanks, Tom. I think Samantha Marcus might have a question. We saw she came off mute. Samantha, do you have a question? Uh, nope. It's all yours. <laughs> no question. Oh, you're good. Okay, thanks. Other questions? So, so what's next? Where do you guys, where do you take this from here? Uh, what's next? I think that we continue to sound the alarm, all right? Again, I think we have uh, data that uh, tells a, a very strong story about what we need in the state of New Jersey right now. On the budget side, we're gonna continue to advocate for the responsible budget and proposals that we have put forth that we've outlined on ways to do this differently. Um, and then we need to continue our march toward uh, the, the continued reopening of the state of New Jersey. The governor says that data drives dates and public health determines um, economic health. Um, look, the numbers are on our side and have been. Uh, we're, you know, great that the governor acknowledges that we have some of the best numbers in the country. Fantastic. Uh, that shows that with the population having been out over the summer, et cetera, that New Jersey businesses are doing what they said they could do all along. They could check the safeguard boxes. They could make their premises uh, safe for their workforce, their patrons, and anyone who visits their facilities. And we need to continue to drive home that 25% capacity does not in the least mean that New Jersey is open for business. We need to get New Jersey open for business because as we've said, it's only those job creators and the economics that they drive that will help to get our economy back in the shape that it needs to be. Hey Tom, our, our, uh, if you look at the revenue uh, projections, of the governor's August 25th budget versus his February budget, the, the three primary revenue drivers in New Jersey are gross income tax, CBT, and sales tax. Between February and August, that number dropped 16%. And based on last year's budget of those same, uh, achievement of those same numbers, we are down almost 10%, which means that we are not growing, we are dropping in the essential revenue areas by 10% in one year. There's nothing in the budget that really addresses that drop in revenue. If we don't turn our revenue numbers around and start to get organic growth in our revenue numbers, our state economy is gonna be driven to the depths we've never seen before. And the only way to fill that 
is to dramatically cut services or to try to borrow more money, which would be totally catastrophic. So there's nothing in this budget that talks to growing the economy, nothing. And, you know, let's talk about an incentive program. We haven't had an incentive program now for 15 months in the state of New Jersey, probably one of the few states in the country in that category. And the governor talked last week about, uh, in one of his press conferences, about incentivizing the small and medium-sized businesses. Well, there's nothing in the budget that talks to that. And I don't know if there's any discussions going on to that. We have to get somebody in our legislature to realize that growing the business community, growing jobs, growing revenue organically is the only way out of this mess. uh, Because this budget right now does the exact opposite. It defaults to debt, it, it, it defaults to taxes, and that is very, very, very difficult for any, any state to overcome once you get on that uh, addictive path of uh, support that is all one-time support. So I just want to uh, turn over to, to Chris Emmaholtz one more time because, you know, OLS projects that revenues will be $1.4 billion more than the governor, uh, and I'd like Chris to talk to that for a minute because that's significantly important to this exact question. Chris? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. We're seeing news coming out and, and um, news that some of you are reporting. Uh, OLS revenue projections over the three-month budget that we're currently in and the nine-month budget that's proposed is $1.4 billion higher than the governor's projections. Um, and that, that's a rosier picture on income tax is the big one, but it's also sales and corporate business taxes. And so that $1.4 billion Obviously, there's always a back and forth, and, and revenues are never going to be identical between OLS and the governor, but, but OLS's job is to give the legislature some data, some, um, some, some way to go back and forth with the governor and not just accept the governor's numbers. And now you have $1.4 billion more on top of the, um, the money that Michelle outlined for surplus and pension. And so you can get to 2.1 billion was just outlined by Michelle. You add 1.4 to that, you now have three and a half billion dollars of money that can go to reduce that five billion dollars of new taxes and borrowing. And so we can get to a healthier budget in a fairly easy, responsible way without actually cutting any programs that hurt the people of New Jersey. Just avoiding some of that um, increase in surplus, avoiding the increase in pension, and using that that rosier revenue projection. And OLS, uh, who not too long ago was called the Dr. Kowarkian, um, for not being as rosy as maybe a governor projected, a uh, governor would like. Um, now they're they're being more more optimistic, and I think there's there's a lot of reason to think that that projection is is real, valid, legitimate one. So, and I just want to, uh, I want to, we talk all the time about the importance of hearing from boots on the ground, you know, we, we give survey data, et cetera, but, you know, Mary Lou made a comment about what she saw in some of the hospitality industry over the weekend. Um, Al Licata jo- dropped me a note saying that he spent time this weekend visiting a lot of his uh, small businesses, and I'd love you to get a boots on the ground perspective. So, Al, you want to share, please? Thank you, Michelle. Yes, I, I spent the weekend visiting our hospitality members. Um, it, and it came across uh, very starkly that there were four driving points that all of the restaurant tours made to me. Uh, number one, they were given, most of them did not open with the 25%. That was first and foremost. The reasons they gave were they had limited notice and didn't have enough time to, to get the staff and train the staff and put them in place. Number two, at 25%, uh, The matrix didn't work for them to hire those new people to handle the inside while they're still trying to do the outside to make their nut. Number three, they had very little confidence in the governor. And it was really quite amazing that because he had pulled the rug out under them back in the uh, late spring, early summer about the indoor dining, a lot of them had taken on a lot of debt and prepared for indoor dining. And they didn't want to take the chance on opening again, only to be pulled out because of some of the comments he'd made recently in the public saying that, look, if he sees a spike, he's going to just pull the rug out from under them. A lot of them are suffering under the PPP rules right now. And what's very concerning, especially to me, is that I actually went and visited. Two of them were sitting with their attorney and their accountants, uh, and they were having a hard time trying to make that final decision. Uh, because the PPP rules, uh, they, they used some of the money because they couldn't get their their doors open, they couldn't create the the profit, they used some of it for the mortgages, for the rent payments, for bills. Now that money is becoming due, they don't know where it's coming from. 
So that's, you know, when you say all politics is local, these are restaurants and businesses that have been in our community for decades, in some cases, decades since I was in high school. To see them have to close now at no fault of their own, who've been great contributors, hiring people, giving them benefits, providing for sponsorships to our schools, our charitable organizations, and the town functions. To see them have to go out under these kind of situations is just unacceptable in our state. We can do better. And that was a predominant theme. And our, we, have, we have chamber members from our chamber in both Somerset and Morris County. And it was just sad. It was, instead of celebrating the holiday weekend, I've got business owners with papers across desks just scratching their head wondering how they're going to make the payroll for the week. So I just wanted to share that with you because it was on a holiday weekend, Labor Day weekend, it was quite astounding. Yeah, thanks for sharing that, Al. Um, can I just jump in what Al just said? Like, I Go ahead, Mary. think Go that ahead. that's a great point. The, the PPP, I get asked how many restaurants do you think are not going to make it, right? And that number is, it, it's a pretty significant number. And they're either not going to reopen or they're going to close by the end of the year because of PPP. And the concept was great, um, but the execution, it will really end up devastating the restaurant industry just as much as being closed because they're trying to figure out how do they pay that back. I mean, the forgiveness part got changed, but Al, that, that's a great point, what you, what you brought about the PPP. And I just wanted to note that um, Al is with the, he runs the Bernard's Township Regional Chamber of Commerce in case anyone didn't have his, his affiliation. Any other questions? Anything any of our business colleagues want to share um, that is in, in response or in the realm of everything we've been talking about? All right. Well, we want to thank you for joining us this morning. Um, again, I think, you know, Tom Bergeron, you asked what's next, and uh, I think you'll continue to, to see, um, again, our, our, our march forward on this for these very significant issues. And um, just we all need to keep in mind that it is the job creators that will drive the economic comeback. And we need a budget that will enable the job creators to get our workforce back to work. Because what that does is it gets people off of unemployment. It creates revenue to the state. Great businesses make great communities. That means that they're going to be giving back in their local regions again and the boots on the ground. That's how the economy flourishes and thrives. And that's what we're looking for. Let's enable those job creators with a responsible budget. Tom Bracken, you want to add anything else in closing? Yeah, I would just say that we need a budget that really reflects the reality that we're in right now. The budget that's being proposed by the governor is, is more a budget that would be proposed when economic times were great and we were rolling along at a very high level. We are not anywhere near that. We need, this is the ideal time as most businesses are doing to really have an introspective look at where we are and to do something dramatic, to make a change and to restart our economy. The ideal time to do it, I hope the legislature takes the bull by the horns and starts to drive it that way. But um, this budget does not reflect anywhere near closely the reality that we're facing right now. Okay. Well, with that, as we said, we've crushed the curve. Let's not crush the economy. Let's get it restarted. So we want to thank you all for joining us this morning and uh, have a great day, everyone. Continue to be well.